Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the next episode of EADJ. My name is Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, and I am your host and the founder of EADJ. Engine for Our Democracy and Justice is a trans interdisciplinary and trans institutional project in collaboration with Vanderbilt University, Fritz Museum, Fisk University, and One Million of Conversation. EADJ was launched in 2018, and we're trying through our program to reach a large group of individuals and ideas in the question of democracy, justice, and art. I am reaching you today from Tennessee, Nashville, from the ground of the Vanderbilt University, ancestral land of the Muskogee, the Cherokee, and the Shawani. Also, I am reaching you today with the ancestral energy of all the diaspora Africans who came to this land and helped build culture, wealth, and beauty. Today, we move in the episode, Performativity and the Social Body. In this Wednesday, November 4, 2020, what an auspicious day to think about social performativity and the role that us all played, construct, and insert in the destiny not only of our personal life, but our collective experience. What could I say it in a day such as November 4th, 2020? In my introduction to EADJ, I spoke about justice and human right and in the presence and the permission and the ability of all of us to live with freedom, with equality, and with dignity. To those of you who have been with us for the last previous five episodes, or those of you who are joining us for the first time today, I say thank you and gratitude for joining us in this conversation, in this inquiry about how do we move forward in collective, in togetherness, in, solid, in solidarity? And how do we face forward the difficulties and the potential of absolutely understanding that our destiny rely in our interconnectedness and interdependence? To all of you, welcome to EADJ. And please let me welcome Marina Fokiri, Program Curator. Thank you. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone from everywhere in the world. And Magda, thank you so much. It's always tough to take the word from Magda because of her wise words, but my immense gratitude for making us part of your vision and giving us the chance to walk together with you in this challenging and gratifying path that brings us here today. What a day. It's a big honor, of course, to be invited to be part of uh, the family of en engine, art, uh, engine of Art, Democracy and Justice. And I'm cr truly grateful to all the team and their huge effort, but I'm also truly grateful to our participating guests, speakers, uh, moderators, respondents, friends, whose knowledge and practice have been informing us for a long time now, much beyond the time of this uh, webinar, and also their practice has been influencing us to put together this program. Special day today with the US election, and in my mind comes the words of Chelsea Manning that once said in an interview that the system should be changed, should have a radical change. She, she once said, how can it be that we give the trust one single male individual to govern the whole planet? Maybe she's right. Particularly special times as uh, dealt with rage and attacks, 
the last days we saw again attacks in Paris, in Vienna, and in Kabul. Philosopher Lajuna Padurai writes, one man's imagined community is another man's political prison. And ISIS seems to know very well how to manipulate those in need this time, in need. The right to expose a country's citizens to death, the so-called necropolitics in honor of our panelists today, uh, that is one of their favorite subjects, is now more legitimate than ever, due also to the shattering pandemic uh, and the side effects in society and economy. We are clearly in a biopower war and all we hear is that we are all together in this, while the responsibility for the protection of each other and our self protection seems to be an individual task. There has been almost two months in which we are meeting here every Wednesday, discussing how to be together, how to live in this common precarious selves while man maintaining polyphony. We have been reflecting to the restoration of democracy and justice and sharing intensities while we are in this cloud as of no other better uh, alternative uh, to of course a net a cooperation that gets richer and richer with every word of us. However, we are here and for the last episodes we've been hearing accounts from Accra, Berlin, Boston, Belgium, Cameroon, Chicago, Ithaca, Melbourne, uh, Sudan, Johannesburg, Athens, and of course Nashville, to just name a few, and we go on. It's important to remember that the world is not only one place, and especially not one place where the highest um, accumulation of money is. How can we form an agile and heterogeneous social body that eludes the familiar strategies of dehumanization and dis disenfranchisement of the polyethnic, polycultural, and polydirectional citizens? I don't know, but we are here today to listen our speakers, our distinguished speakers talking about that. And with no further ado, I would like to introduce you Octavio Zaya, the moderator of today's panel. Octavio is a friend and all a critic, a curator. He was the director of um, Atlantica magazine for many years, and he was also one of the uh, member of the curatorial team under Oquia and Nezor's uh, documentary lesson. Octavio, hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Marina. Thank you, Professor Maria Magdalena Campos Pons. Thank you, Paul Preciado, Regina Jose Galindo, Pablo La Fuente, Oki Okpo Wasili. And thank you all for joining us today. I also would like to acknowledge those people from behind the screen, such as coordinators, technical support, and translators that are making possible, uh, that are making this webinar webinar possible, like Natalia Filio, Megan Rust, Mary Tesak, Elise Burns, Anais Dali, and Elsa Mercado. Also, I cannot avoid a few words about the US elections still undecided. I can only express my disappointment and sadness. After four years of nightmare, violence, racism, misogynia and policies that continue to divide the United States and isolate the country from the world. It, it is very tragic that the United States people have not clearly rejected and repudiated this regime of chaos. But I'm going to stay within the limits of the subject that have been highlighted by Marina Fokidis, the curator of these episodes. Of course, I have some comments and questions that I will share if we have any time during the conversation. In the meantime, following where the previous episode fifth left, I should remind us all that a democratic and, and just social body is not a homogeneous crowd. How can we form an agile, agile and heterogeneous body that eludes the familiar strategies of dehumanization and disenfranchisement of polyethnic, polycultural, and polydirectional citizens. 
that's what Marina just told us, just asked to us. What is the shape that we may imagine for a critical mass of intellectual dissidents who come together? Following the episode five, this sixth episode will consider performativity as a practice of resilience, resistance, and transcendence. Sociality, subjectivity, and other concepts of embodied research will be discussed as antidotes to structures of oppression, inequality, white supremacy, and patriarchy, and perhaps a reconsideration, rethinking, and redefinition of the fetishized and patriarchal body. Paying close attention to emotional and political gesture, gestures that bring buried histories to the fore, we will rediscover and conjure ways to survive in this chaotic and menacing world. Many of you know the participants of this panel very well. They are accomplished cultural and art producers, thinkers, and curators who have illuminated ideas and questions worldwide. But perhaps many of you are not familiar with them, and that's why without further ado, I'm going to introduce them to you. Paul Preciado is a philosopher, curator, and one of the leading thinkers in the study of gender, sexual, and body politics. Fulbright Fellow, he, taught, he holds a PhD in philosophy and theory of architecture from P Princeton University. He is the author of books such as Contrasexual Manifesto from Columbia University, Testo Yankee, Sex, Drugs, and Biopolity from the Feminist Press, Pornotopia from some books for which he was awarded the Sade Prize in France. And many other books that I'm that I'm going to pass because we we try to to shorten these long biographies. He has taught philosophy of the body and transfeminist theory at the University of Paris at Saint Denis and at New York University. From 2014 to 2017, he was curator of public programs of Documenta 14 in Castle and Athens, where he started the project The Parliament of Body. He is associate philosopher at the Pompidou Center, and his new book, Can the Monster Speaks, will be published at, at, uh, shortly in 2021. Uh, Okui Okpawasili is a Brooklyn based performing artist working at the intersection of theater, dance, and installation. Her work considers the dynamic of interiority and psychic space in shaping relationships, sociality, and memory grounded in the body and perspective of the Afro-feminist uh, family. In partnership with, uh, with collaborator Peter Bond, Okpa Wasili created multidisciplinary projects. They include Bessie, our winning pent up, a revenge dance, Bessie, our, our winning bronze gothic, bronze, bronze gothic, the oval poor people, TV room, uh, poor people's TV room solo, when I return, who will receive me, and Aduka's revolt. In the last few years, Okpa Wasili has been working on sitting on a man's head, a collaborative improvisational sonic praxis with multiple artists inspired by the pre-colonial and body protest practices of Southern Nigeria women called Sitting on a Man. As a performer of Pogwafili frequently collaborates with our winning director, Ralph Lemon, in many different uh, instances. Opogwafili Residencies and awards include the French American Cultural Exchange, MAGLS National Cent uh, Center for Choreography, uh, Choreography Fellow, Barishnikos Art Center Artist in Resident, and a long list that go on and on. Pablo La Fuente, together with Keina Ellison, is the artistic director of the Museo de Arte Moderna in Rio de Janeiro. 
He worked as a curator, educator, and writer, always engaging in collaborative processes. Paul has, was the co-curator of exhibitions like the Aguatapora, Rio de Janeiro Indígena, uh, developed with indigenous communities from the state of Rio, of Rio de Janeiro, uh, with Sandra Benite, Jose Besa, and, and Clarissa Diniz, and of the 31st Biennial of Sao Paulo in 2014, in collaboration uh, with Galir Elia, Nurian Gita, Charles Esch, Luisa Proenza, Oren Sagib, and Benjamin Serusi. Paul is also an editor for Aster, uh, uh, um, after all, exhibition history book series, which he co-founded, and is currently working on a research and exhibition project on the indigenous struggle for territory. Sawe for Sex is Piringa, with Sandra Benitez, Mauricio Fonseca, and Ayaya Tucano, I believe, in Sao Paulo. Finally, Regina Jose Galindo is a visual artist and poet whose main medium is performance. Galindo lives and works in, in Guatemala, using his own context uh, as a starting point to explore and uh, accuse the ethical implication of social violence and injustices related to gender and racial discrimination, as well as human rights abuses arising from the endemic inequalities in power relationship in contemporary societies. Galindo is, in Loris Romano words, an artist who pushes herself beyond her own limits through performances which are radical, unsettling, and ethnically discomforting. Galindo received the Golden Lion for Best Young Artist of the 51st Biennial in Venice for her work, Quien Puede Borrar Las Huellas and Imenoplastia, two crucial pieces of her, of her work which critique Guatemalan violence that come from misconceptions of morality and from gender violence. In 2011, she was awarded with the prize, the Prince Klaus Award from the Netherlands for her ability to transform injustices and outrage into powerful public acts that demand a response. She participated in three Venice Biennales and she also more recently have been, was involved in Documenta 14 in Athens and Castle. And with further ado, I'm going to give the baton to Pablo, uh, Paul, Paul Cristiano. Thank you all. Hello. I think uh, now I'm, I'm with you online, I think. Yes. Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm I'm Paul B. Preciado, and I'm really happy to be here with you, particularly in a, in a day like today. Uh, as many of the speakers before myself said, it is a, a crucial day to be here together, and I'm so happy that we can really be doing collectively, in a sense, almost like a political ritual, while all these votes are being counted. So that we're here discussing and, and bringing probably like a, some uh, critical and political energy to what is happening in the US and all around. Uh, I wanted to say uh, first, uh, thank you to the, the people that invited me to be here with you today. Of course, uh, Maria Madalena Campos Pons, uh, such an amazing artist and someone that I had the, the pleasure of meeting in uh, during the Documenta 14 project and as well as uh, Octavio Zaya and Marina Fokidis. Uh, really thank you for, for having me today and for bringing me to this, uh, to this discussion and this project. And of course, everyone else from the Engine for Democracy and Justice on the artists and panelists as well. Uh, Okwi, Regina and Pablo, I'm really uh, delighted to be here with you and honored to be in discussing with you. Well, I have to say that uh, I'm probably the only, the only kind of a, let's say, critical thinker or philosopher that is here with you today. And, and in that respect, um, I was given by uh, Marina and Octavio a little bit of the, uh, the task of uh, giving like a framework to this discussion on the body. 
uh, on the body and the social body and performativity. On um, well, I, I've been, uh, I guess, as as a philosopher and both like an activist, uh, I have been during the last 20, 25 years uh, participating on an ongoing discussion on the body and kind of political reformulation of the body. And, and I've been, um, my, my contention is that I, I um, had at, at a certain point, I, I had the, the need to start working with a different notion that is not exactly the notion of the body. And I will explain you why, why this notion of body is becoming like somehow a little bit of problem, a little bit of a problem for me to work within, both within philosophy and within the arts. And why, uh, and this is gonna be like my, my first statement, why I'm proposing to move from this traditional notion of the body into a different notion that I'm calling somatic and or the somatic apparatus. And I will explain to you why I'm doing that. And then I will go into kind of a, a, an archeology span of the somatic, trying to, to explain to you that most notions that we use of the body are just one of the political fictions of the somatic, some of the political fictions of the somatic that were invented during the, uh, the colonial and uh, capitalist development since the 15th century towards the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, and that have been the objects of a critical and political uh, fight and, and, and let's say struggle. And therefore maybe it's more interesting not to speak uh, of the, about the body as this would be like a single uh, ontological notion, but to open that, that category into something else that I'm calling the somatic. Uh, for, in order for, for you to understand what I'm coming from with this notion of somatic, I will tell you that um, um, just as a kind of a background, if you think about uh, Freud in, the, in the, the beginning of the 20th century, and, and well, many of you that maybe follow my, my work know that I'm, I'm not particularly, I mean, I mean not uh, uh, particularly keen on psychoanalysis as, as an institution or uh, a theory of, of the mind, but I am a reader of, uh, of Freud for sure. And one of the things that I, I, I think that are extremely interesting in Freud is that at the beginning of the 20th century, Freud uh, understands that uh, consciousness cannot be the only notion with which he can approach the psychic realm. And therefore, in order to, to give a space for something else that is not consciousness, which is for him the unconscious, he's gonna open up this notion of consciousness, kind of explode that, that notion and start speaking uh, of a different topography and somehow a different ontology as well, which is gonna be what he's gonna call the psychic apparatus. Well, in a certain way, I think that with the notion of the body, something similar should happen. My uh, contention is that we cannot truly speak only about the body uh, since this notion of the body has been reduced, and I will explain you why, has been reduced to an object, an anatomical object, or has been reduced in a certain sense to, to kind of a, a property of the, of the subject, of the legal subject, uh, and why this notion of the body is too restricted and we need to work with a larger notion. And this notion is what I'm calling the somatic apparatus or the somatic. So I'm, I'm calling the somatic um, um, a political living fiction. And I think that this might also hope to understand some of the work uh, some of the, the work of the artists that we will be discussing today, such as Oquis or, or Regina's, uh, whose uh, my, my idea would be that neither of them work with the body, but both of them work with the somatic. Both of them work with the, the body as a political living archive and not just as an anatomical object or a property of the subject, right? 
so that's that's my 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 first point for the discussion today that I want what I would like to to offer to you for as a kind of a framework for the discussion that will come later. And um, so once that I, I have like open up this notion of the body or maybe displace that notion and open up this other notion of the um, somatic apparatus or, or the somatech, I like to go with you into what are the main normative political fictions of the somatech that had been reduced to the body historically, right? And that we turn to, uh, in a sense, we, we take too easily as if they were the body, right? I would say that, that um, and I, of course, I will, I will remain within the, the historical framework of uh, colonial patriarchal mo modernity. Let's say I'm not going to speak to you, of course, about something that is like not, not referred to the, the, the Western uh, colonial modernity, since basically I think that that's the framework in which we are, unfortunately, uh, politically working, working into. I would say that first, we have to keep in mind that um, the body was invented as uh, a collection of organs by the medical and anatomic discourse after the 15th century. And I would, I would like to add something else to that, which I think is quite crucial to understand the work of the artists, both uh, Oquis and Regina's, but I could say uh, many other art, contemporary artists as well. When, when the, the body is, is invented as a collection of organs, and therefore it becomes an object of anatomic discourse and medical discourse, is also invented through uh, a new practice of vision, which is dissection, and which of course works not with the living body, but with the, the, the dead body, with the corpse, and which also has the, the possibility for the first time in history, if we think about the, um, the prohibition of uh, dissect, dissect, dissecting bodies before, before the 15th century, um, what is invented together with this uh, anatomic body of the 15th century is also the body as interiority, a body that can be seen from outside. And I would say in a sense, a body in, in which power can actually infiltrate, act, and as through vision and as vision. So, I think that this is quite crucial to understand some of the, uh, the critical and political practices of artists today, because they are or they will be uh, struggling with uh, this relationship between power and fiction that has constructed the normative body from the 15th century. I would say that what is crucial to understand if we think about this, this body as a collection of organs, right? is that from, from the moment in which, in which the, uh, within this taxonomy, general taxonomy of, of beings uh, that biological, chemical, um, physical discourses that will proliferate from the, from the 15th century up to especially the 18th and the 19th century is the invention of, the, uh, of sexual difference as anatomic inscription, right? And, and therefore, the invention of the gender body as something that has gonna be, that will be given uh, an ontology, that will be given uh, an, an, an anatomic, uh, let's say, materiality to it, right? And I would like to stress that this notion of the of sexual difference and the inscription of sexual difference within um, material anatomy is quite recent. It's really dating from the 16th, 17th century. And of course, it will from the beginning generate an enormous amount of trouble, especially at the beginning with notions that had to do with uh, the hermaphrodites and that will learn later become questions of the intersex, right? So, and I would say that it will be more interesting for us to, instead of thinking uh, 
of speaking about the, the gender body or the, or the body as sexual difference or as, as uh, the sex body it will be more interesting to think of the epistemology of sexual difference, the epistemology of gender difference that will provoke, that will construct, that, um, that will create and inscribe those difference within the body. So in a sense, what I'm trying to say is, is to pay attention how the, uh, the, the sex and gender body as a binary has been histor historically constructed, right? Instead of thinking uh, of the, the, the sexual body as a natural given. Uh, the, second, the second element that I'd like to, to speak about is, is related to the, the body as, as property. And, and in this, I, of course, will, will refer to the, the, the work of uh, both uh, Saidija Harman and Achille Nembe on the history of coloniality. And of course, like in this, in this respect, uh, Maria Madalena Campos Pon has done also an amazing, an amazing work uh, on studying this, this critical and political genealogy. I would say that it's quite crucial to get to understand that um, the body was uh, constructed and um, fictionally, or like basically created as a political living fiction, as a property through uh, capitalist colonial expansion and through series of uh, legal and economic techniques that are related to the history of colonialism. Among which, for instance, I could just quote one that has been uh, a study in depth by, by Magdalena Campos Pons, which is precisely the Code Noir, the so-called Black Code, which is both a legal and an economic treatise from the, the 17th and early 18th century in, in which basically um, the body of the, the racialized body uh, in, in primarily of uh, African um, uh, slaves that were called, uh, ca captured in the, from the, uh, we could say from the early 16th century was considered as a property and therefore well, was considered as um, a commercial good that could be sold and bought. Uh, I, I, I'm saying this because I think it's quite interesting to try to unravel the history of uh, liberalism as a history of the invention of the body as private property, right? So we could say that liberalism is, this, is not just an economic theory, but it's also a theory of the body which makes a, a critical difference between those that own their own body as property and those who are expropriated of their bodies and whose bodies can be bought and sold, right? And therefore, we could also reread critically, in a sense, uh, the history of anti-racist, anti-colonial struggles as a history of critical reappropriation of the body, right? Uh, but I, I insist, this is not what we're speaking about here, is not the body as an ontological entity, but just one of the, the political fictions of the somatic, one of the political fictions uh, invented through the colonial regime, through the patriarchal regime, if we think about sexual difference, as I was saying before. The third element that I would like to, to put on the, on the table for us today uh, for the discussion is the way in which the body was also constructed as workforce. And, and of course, these related to the history of capitalism and most particularly to the history of Taylorism and the scientific management of, of work. And I'm saying this because in a sense, uh, if we take these three fictions um, the body as, as sexualized through the anatomic discourse, the body racialized through the, uh, the colonial enterprise and the body transformed into a workforce. I think that we, we might have uh, an, an interesting cartography to start to understand how the uh, 
the modern somatic was constructed, right? Uh, but also what will be the, the critical and political technologies that will be uh, used to, in a sense, disidentify the body from this collection of organs, to disidentify the body from the being a property, to disidentify the body as workforce, and therefore to look or invent for new definitions or new political fictions of the body, which uh, in a sense I could, and maybe with this I will, I will uh, just like uh, leave it here because I see that it's already like, uh, it's more than, than 4.30 and I, I kind of maybe went way beyond the, the time that I had, but uh, I, I guess that this might be one of the, uh, for me at least one of the definitions of what art could be or could be uh, the, the space for invention of, a, of a new techniques of the body, in a sense, right? Like new techniques that might come to uh, disidentify the body from the, uh, the, on one side from the collection of organs, on, on another side from the being a property, and on the other side from being a workforce. And of course, this is just like a, is, is really like a, a, a very sketchy uh, framework because of this, this could be much, much larger, larger than that. But I, I just wanted to put this on the table uh, for, for later discussion. And, and maybe with the, of course, with the, the words of, uh, of Okwi and Regina and Pablo, this will become uh, more complex. Thank you so much, thanks. Thank you, Paul. Please, Okwi, go ahead. Well, you know, thank you, everybody. Um, um, I guess you're, Paul, you're putting some really interesting things on the table because my question is, um, rather than deprivileging the body, I, I want to privilege the body in some sense, or at least when I think of somatic, a somatic practice, I think about a sensation, a practice of body mm -hmm. sensation. And how have we been sort of, um, disincentivized or, or, or cut off from our ability to have sensation within the body and also to recognize and feel the sensation of others. And this is one of my main concerns. Obviously, this is a terrible, terrible day in the US. Um, I think that there is a real reckoning with, um, yes, in some senses, how some bodies, of course, matter, right? The mattering of some bodies in a way that um, privileges their sensation um, and their concerns. And then of course, um, certain bodies, yes, relegated to a collection of organs, relegated to um, excessive, um, ex ex excessive uh, we could even say when we think of the plight of undocumented immigrants here, there's sort of excess material, right? Where, to, like, where should it be put? So. So I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm thinking about register. And so there was a work and a practice that I was engaging in called sitting on a, you know, on a man's head. Octavio, thank you very much um, for talking about this, but cry, trying to create the space where people could sense others as much as themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and in that sense, um, and from that sensation, how could we make a, a, you know, sonic screams and cries in some way, acknowledge the collisions, be, um, be in some sense um, deeply attuned to the collisions of other bodies and the ways in which um, we, we are colliding or sometimes acting in agreement. Um, but yeah, but you know, you you know, you stay up all night and then wake up in the morning thinking, or I'm thinking, what is the tr is that enough? What is the true work? Um, because so so I don't know, Paul, if you could just talk yeah. to me about, I don't yeah. know, the, the, it's not you know what the hmm, yeah, yeah, yeah. the distinction, right? Because maybe I'm yeah. thinking a distinction is about a yeah. sensing, sensitized, a feeling thing, right? Mm. And how some of us recently just got the privilege. To Mm -hmm. back into our bodies to sense and feel, you know, because I think there are a lot of, especially, you know, Black folks, a lot of us, particularly Black men, who don't necessarily feel the privilege feeling in their body because it's always at, in some ways, at the mercy of the state or in, at any moment, it could be that body or that sensation, that lived sensation can be cut off. Um, yes. 
Yes. Um, it's a struggle right now. It's a terrible, terrible day. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but we have to uh, thank you so much, Okwe, for your your words and your, your question. Uh, we have to stick together, whatever it happens, you know? I mean, it's a terrible day, but, but it's also, uh, we, if we look back into history, uh, we've been through worse things than this, right? So right. We're, gonna, we're gonna go on. And, and I think that it's super important that, uh, that in a sense that we keep the, uh, the, the political energy and, and in a sense, like a kind of the, this critical hope uh, that that things will change. I'm 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 a kind of a pathological optimistic, and I I then um, <laughs> what is what happening even now the worst things that will happen. I see them as the last moments. Maybe this last moment will will last for seventy years, but I see it as the last moment of the patriarchal colonial regime. This is what I see. And, and I don't mind what is happening, even if the states, even if, you know, you go with a Trump for, and unfortunately for another four years, this is gonna be at once the, the end of, a, of the patriarchal colonial regime. And that's, that's what I, is my feeling. And I think that that's the, what we should hold together for. And if this takes like 50 years and it takes all our lives, well, it's too bad for us, but I think the future is different. I think that's what I, that's why my feeling is. And, and after saying this, I, um, I just mm. want to say something that maybe was not so clear when I spoke, is that, um, yes, and I totally agree with you, Okwi, I think that the question is that certain bodies were not recognized politically as subjects, right? So they were, in a sense, reduced to the very materiality but they never got to be recognized political subjectivity. But I think that precisely this, this is what is so interesting about what is happening today, because this gap is, is changing in a sense. In a sense, those bodies that had not been recognized politically are now as speaking by themselves. We are speaking as, as homosexuals, as trans women or men, as uh, racialized bodies, as disabled bodies and so on and so forth, and saying we do have the, the right to be recognized as political subjects, right? So in a sense, uh, I, I do agree with you, the question of the register of sensations is super important because until now, only one subject was acknowledged as having political sovereignty and therefore only his sensations were given uh, political and ontologic value. The other, that's what I was trying to say, that the other bodies were basically reduced to a collection of organs, reduced to being just like a workforce, reduced to be um, a reproductive force, reduced to be a property and so, so on and so forth, right? Uh, but that, uh, so in a sense, what I'm trying to say is that, and that's why the notion of, of the body is interesting to me, but only if it becomes, um, much more larger in a sense, because for me, the problem is that when it's big one is like too naturalized, uh, you know, it's easily reduced to, uh, to the materiality. For instance, you know, the ways, for instance, uh, I, I, especially in gender, in gender issues, how, uh, but also in, in race issues, you know, how um, the, the complexity of the, uh, the historical construction of, our objectivized, objectivized bodies has been reduced to genitality, has been reduced to color skin, has been reduced, well, no. This is not just, a, you know, that's what I'm trying to say. This is not a question of genitality, it's not a question of a skin color, it's not a, this is a question of the, the political construction of the somatic, which is much larger, larger and therefore maybe to, to put it in your terms, to basically acknowledging other sensations, other registers that become now, uh, in a sense, like full political subjects, and that before were reduced just to the materiality of a of, of a body, right? I don't know if um, this is making sense, Okwe. Yes, it, it it is. I mean, I you know, I definitely think that there is a sense right now too of um, opening up. Yes, that that sense of the somatic, right? That if we can expand 
or at least exist in that liminal space between the beginning of one's body and the beginning of another body, right? Yes. Like, and actually, if that if the body can be contained in that space, but I must say that there is a particular condition because of blackness, because of you know genitalia, because of the categorization of others, or um, you know, or because of the categorization of you know a very powerful and violent state to put me in a particular place, that there is a history, there is a particular kind of marking of my body that does in some ways give me some kind of information and a, you know, and a different sort of desire and position. Um, so I cannot, I cannot negate that. I can argue the, I can argue about what those positions, how that position, what that positionality means, but, um, but also I feel, uh, afraid to be limited within a particular European kind of tax taxonomic or um, um, taxonomy of, of, of body uh, where, you know, you think about in uh, parts of Nigeria or, you know, secret societies where they think they might like their maids, there's the ancestral body, right? A particular kind of um, a particular masquerade that people, you can enter actually a constructed body to join past bodies, right? Yes. So, but maybe it's like, I'm just, but Paul, yeah. yeah, what you said is right. No, I don't know why I'm getting I'm stuck saying, on body because I feel like body is somehow, but I think it's the same. No, I mean, it's just what I'm, what I'm trying to do, but I totally agree with you. And it's what I'm trying to do is basically in a sense, um, too often when we say body, uh, immediately people think that they know what it, they are speaking about. And this is, is this thing, you know what I mean? It's that like this physical right. thing. And that's I, exactly, I, and so this is what I love. If we, yes, that's what, and I think that when you're referring to Nigeria, for instance, I think that this is kind of critical and crucial uh, it, for us to get to understand that the uh, uh, the somatic apparatus is precisely not just the the physical body, but something else. And this is clear not just in a, Nigeria, but in, you know, in any kind of a cultural construction. Uh, yes, absolutely. Both in relation to uh, to um, you know representation, uh, myths, uh, narratives, technology, uh, social interaction. That's that's what I refer to when I say um, somatic apparatus or somatic. In order for us to basically to kind of a, a set up some some limit to this this Western notion of the body that has been kind of overimposed on us and that has also, it's a, it's a very, uh, the metaphysics of this notion is, is horrific because in a sense, it's like, it be, it's the base of all the other binaries in a sense, is this notion of the, the soul and the body is, is basically uh, the, in a sense, like almost like the, the framework of the matrix of all, of all the other notions that will come into, into being, like basically like, a, uh, of course, uh, male, female, heterosexuality, homosexuality, nature, culture, white, non-white, etc. right? So uh, that's what I'm so reluctant to, to basically like overload this notion of the body. And I'm trying to, to, to take some distance from it and to gain precisely uh, performative agency in relation to it. Like how we uh, open up that notion to be able to work with it, right? Yeah. Thank you, all queen. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. It was great for the suggestion. <laughs> Thank you, Okui and Paul, for this incredible and um, very, very engaging conversation. Uh, unfortunately, I have to pass it on now to Regina, that also, I guess, that have very interesting and engaging ways of uh, involving herself into this conversation. Thank you. Regina, I have. Hola. Eh, buenos días. Primero, gracias por la invitación. Es un día súper triste para el, el, el mundo entero. Yo estuve hace cuatro años en Vanderbilt, justamente para la primera elección de Trump. Me tocó vivir la celebración, me tocó escuchar insultos porque yo caminaba por las calles. Así que es bastante casual que nuevamente esté compartiendo en Vanderbilt en este momento que es tan fatídico para todas y todos. 
entiendo eh, los puntos de Paul, ¿no? Cuando habla que el cuerpo va mucho más allá que esta cuestión orgánica y física. Eh, eh, decía que yo entiendo perfectamente los puntos de Paul cuando él habla de un, de un cuerpo que va más allá de lo físico. Y me gustaría aclarar que cuando los cuerpos pertenecemos al sur y pertenecemos a la periferia, estos son puntos más difíciles de debatir porque cargamos con este estigma, con este peso, que es muy difícil quitarnos de encima. Evidentemente, yo soy más que este cuerpo, pero este físico de mujer del sur guatemalteca es la primera imagen que la sociedad debe de mí y esto ya representa y dice algo. Adicionalmente, como individuos que venimos de esta periferia, pues evidentemente nuestro cuerpo carga adicionalmente toda esta memoria genética de lo que nos ha tocado sufrir como pueblos periféricos. Y el texto que voy a leer también corresponde a esta visión de mujer guatemalteca. Hola, mi nombre es Regina Galindo, soy una artista que viene del sur o un poquito más abajo. Vengo del centro, vengo del centro de las Américas, de todo ese continente que es las Américas, porque las Américas es un continente y no solo un país. Soy una poeta y una artista visual y allí nací, en Guatemala, un pequeñísimo país al sur de México, que a su vez está al sur de los Estados Unidos. Pequeño país con grandes riquezas, saqueado y explotado por siempre. Por allí ha pasado de todo, de todo un poco. Pasó la conquista, pasó la colonia, pasó la opresión, Pasó la explotación, pasó el café, pasó el azúcar, pasaron los azotes, pasó Arevalo, pasó Arbenz, pasó la justicia, pasó Estados Unidos, pasó su eterna intervención, pasó la venganza, pasó la noche larga, pasó la oscuridad, pasaron las desapariciones, pasó el terremoto, pasó Ríos Montt, pasó la tierra arrasada, pasó la milpa, la milpa quemada, pasaron las violaciones, pasaron los fetos sacados de las barrigas, pasaron las fosas clandestinas, Pasó el horror, pasó el silencio, pasó el miedo, pasó la huida, pasaron las deportaciones, pasó el huracán, pasaron las maras, pasaron los narcos, pasaron las muertas, pasó la erupción, pasó otro huracán, pasó la mina, pasó otra mina, pasó otra mina, pasó el hambre, pasó la caravana, pasaron los kilómetros andados a pie de muchas mujeres cargando a sus hijos, pasaron las fronteras, pasó Trump, Pasó la tolerancia cero, pasaron las separaciones, pasaron los niños en la prisión, pasaron la muerte de los niños. De esos niños muertos en las prisiones para migrantes ubicadas en los Estados Unidos, de migración, de explotación, de violencia, de las miles y mujeres asesinadas en todo el mundo, de lucha, de fuerza, de resiliencia, de eso es lo que yo hablo en mi trabajo, de lo que no entiendo, de todas esas preguntas que tengo en mi cabeza que no tienen respuesta. A esas preguntas yo les doy forma y las convierto en acción, en demandas, en gritos y en poemas. Como este poema escrito a Ríos Montt durante el juicio por genocidio en el 2013 y dedicado también a cualquier dictador o persona que intenta controlar nuestra vida. Por, pa, por cada milpa que tú quemes, nosotros sembraremos 100 semillas. Por cada feto que tú mates, nosotros criaremos 100 hijos. Por cada mujer que tú violes, nosotras tendremos 100 orgasmos. Por cada hombre que tú tortures, nosotros abrazaremos 100 alegrías. Por cada muerto que tú niegues, nosotros tejeremos 100 verdades. Por cada arma que tú empuñes, nosotros haremos 100 dibujos, por cada bala perdida, 100 poemas, por cada bala encontrada, mil canciones. O este segundo poema con el que cierro esta primera ronda en la que yo hablo, que es un poema que yo le escribí a mis vecinas del norte, mi norte más cercano que es México. Este texto lo escribí antes de la pandemia, poquititos antes de que entráramos en este círculo terrible, cuando las mujeres mexicanas salieron a las calles a exigir sus derechos. 
Los vecinos del norte y nosotros nos parecemos en la desgracia. Allá también desaparecen mujeres, allá también matan niñas, allá también nos violan. Los vecinos del norte nos ven con desprecio y cierran sus fronteras por miedo que nuestra desgracia aumente la suya. Algunos vecinos del norte dicen que la violencia extrema que ellos viven tiene nuestro sello. Dicen que ese sello llegó con los narcos en los noventas, justo cuando nosotros firmamos la paz, justo cuando miles de caibiles se quedaron sin empleo. Yo siento mucha, mucha pena por el dolor que viven nuestros vecinos en el norte y siento mucha pena por nuestro propio dolor. Estos últimos días, las vecinas del norte han salido a la calle y lo han destrozado todo. Nosotras acá, en esta supuesta paz, nos desangramos en silencio. Las madres nos comemos las uñas y las acumulamos con el estómago junto con nuestros miedos. Yo siento admiración por las vecinas del norte. Quiero ser como ellas. También quiero vomitar mi terror y también quiero destrozarlo todo. Gracias. Thank you very much, Regina. And now, Pablo, please go ahead. Hello, um, hello to everybody. Um, I think maybe there's a moment to, to breathe a bit before we, we continue. Um, I don't know if there's time, so sometimes we don't have time to breathe, sometimes we have to continue. Um, I, I want to thank everybody uh, uh, for being here and, and also for inviting me. Um, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's always important to get together and, and, and exchange some, and, uh, but I was, I was traveling myself uh, throughout the, the whole process with the, with the way, with the role that I was uh, going to, uh, that I accepted to, to, to take uh, when I came into this, this, this gathering as a respondent, um, um, as somebody who would come in and, and respond to, to the others immediately uh, uh, to, uh, and, and somehow uh, make sense of things. And, and uh, make sense of things for you who've, who've been listening to what the others have been saying. Uh, um, and I was, I was talking to Tavi, I was talking to Marina, I was thinking, I was uh, rethinking, I was, and I was thinking that this is maybe a detour that is necessary because it does talk about bodies and positions. No? Uh, it does, does talk about how bodies occupy positions together or not, and how some bodies occupy positions that others haven't, haven't been allowed to occupy. And, uh, and I was trying to, 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 to begin uh, this, this uh, response by, by trying not to naturalize the response. How can we not naturalize the response? How can we not uh, 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 assume that, that a response needs to be verbal, uh, that we need to uh, create uh, theories, that we need to, maybe a response is to listen. Uh, to actively listen may mean different things, maybe to act. Obviously, we are far away from each other. Uh, we are not in the same room uh, and we can't, I mean, our responses are mediated by, by a screen, by, a, by tiny boxes. Um, but, uh, but, I, but I think it's important to remind ourselves of that. Um, especially because, um, I mean, uh, we need to, as, as, as many of you, as all of you have, have touched upon or said, I mean, we need to undo the, the, the places that are located. I mean, white, cis, man, from Europe, who lives in Brazil. Um, why, why am I entitled to respond to certain things that, uh, that are not my experience, but that I share uh, or accompany others who have their experience? Um, and uh, how can I talk about issues that, uh, that are attached to me, but maybe not so much? I mean, um, I, was, I, was, uh, I was in deep discussions about this, especially well, for a long time, but also especially for the last few months, because uh, as, as Octavio said, I mean, right now I'm the co I'm the co-director of, of the museum, and this was uh, this was a choice. I mean, Kena and I, Kena Lisa, Kena is uh, is a friend, she's a curator, she's a black woman, 
and uh, this, um, we together decided that we would uh, try to occupy a place together for one that was designed for one body and that was designed for one white body because there's no black directors and there's no women directors in Brazil as many other places. And, uh, and then it was not about uh, uh, me granting Kane a space, but us together deciding that the two bodies together would occupy that space. We'll try to occupy it. And now we go to occupy it and now we have to figure out what to do. Uh, and uh, this also means uh, negotiating a speech. And uh, I'm talking about her now, but uh, she knows what I'm saying. She knows what I'm talking. We negotiate this all the time. What do we say about the other and how do we do it? But also not mixed negotiating the bodies together. Um, Kena talks a lot about uh, dance, dancing. Uh, I'm, I'm not a great dancer. I mean, I, I mean, where I come from, men don't dance. Uh, I, I kind of like engaged in some dancing when I was when I arrived here seven years ago. Um, but it's interesting to think about that about. Uh, how to make your body, or how to uh, um, un unlearn the, the codes that your body learns uh, through processes that are uh, colonial, violent, uh, sexist, uh, and, and that happen constantly in many places. No? Um, so I was, I was thinking about this, uh, listening to all of you, and, and, uh, and uh, thinking how, I mean, in fact, uh, Thinking of strategies and and some some I think Paul said about neo strategies and and uh, and uh, just talk about the, the the writing in poetry the 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 the, the thinking of the body in a different way or, 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 and and the, and the question that I was asking to myself is how do we, how do we negotiate these ways that we invent I mean can we invent ways without negotiating them can we in fact go back to ways that were there before. Uh, because sometimes it's not about critical creation, it's about engaging with tradition and ancestrality. You know? I mean, and this is maybe difficult in some territories, but in other territories, tradition and ancestrality is very much present. Um, I was, and obviously when you engage with tradition, which is not yours, how do you uh, not use it, uh, just uh, take over it and use it? And I want to, to talking about another friend who I've been engaged with uh, in work and in life uh, very much in the last few years, which is Sandra Benitez, who's a Guarani, she's a curator and writer. And, and, um, and Sandra talks a lot about, uh, I mean, we've also had to negotiate many working processes together about, you know, what does this white guy and this indigenous woman do, uh, doing exhibitions of indigenous stuff in museums, which are, uh, colonial import. And uh, one thing that um, um, she talked is about a certain way of getting together to negotiate in conflict um, without, uh, without having any, any um, fiction about resolving things. I mean, we are together, there's no escape. The colonial uh, occupation started, came, continues. It's already here, the violence is there, but how can we operate so that we don't define ourselves by that process? Because we can learn, I mean, I'm talking through her again, which is it's complicated. How can we learn ourselves not to get defined by, by something that is just part of us, but is not all of us, it's not our totality. She talks about, um, um, in, in the Guarani, there is two different dances for women and men. And I just wanted to keep with the dance because somehow, I don't know, maybe it's a connection performativity. And, but uh, sometimes how does the body in, how the bodies within communities learn how to behave with the bodies? And I think that's interesting. Uh, some bodies uh, don't hear, as, as we said, other bodies. And don't, they, can't, they can't sense each other. They actually don't see each other. Uh, and they qualify other bodies, as, as Paul says, as something else. No? Uh, or annihilate them. And the, 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 the dance for the women is, uh, is um, it's a very soft, gentle dance uh, with very little movement. But the dance for the men is very different. It's called Iwira Ija. Uh, and it's super fast. Uh, the, the men run and, and jump uh, to each other. It's like uh, they chase each other. And, uh, and basically, what it, it is, it is uh, they have to be extremely attentive to the body of the other. They have to perceive the body of the other, not to crash against that body. And they have to perceive also uh, when one of the bodies falls. I mean, because the exhaustion makes bodies fall. 
And, uh, and uh, what is the key is that you have to be attentive so that you don't step also on the body that fell. Actually, if you step on the body that falls, you have to dance for the two of them. Um, and, and you have to dance until the end. You are the one, the last one to finish the dance. Um, I was thinking, what is this? I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, I mean, we can call it maybe, I mean, words are tricky. You know? I mean, we can call it a, a social performativity of the body. You know? This is a way of training the body of the men to be careful, to be attentive, to work together, to, uh, to be perceptive of the other, to sense uh, how the other is feeling. Is it getting tired, is it gonna fall? How do I interact with him? How do I uh, not uh, work my anxiety so I can operate with a wider context and world? I mean, these are things that, uh, uh, that uh, I mean, also uh, imply that this body um, is not a, it's never an independent body. I mean, when Octavio said that um, isolation of the US, I mean, this isolation of the US hits, I mean, it doesn't matter, the US isolates itself or doesn't isolate itself. It, it comes crashing down here. Um, I mean, our president is partly an effect of that other president. Uh, so, uh, and and as and I think that you know it is this uh, just to finish. I mean, this 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 uh, uh, behavior, this behavior of the body uh, of the Guarani men in the in the Iwira Ipsa is a technology. It's a technology that they developed to. Uh, teach the young men uh, how their bodies should work with the other bodies of men and the bodies of the women. Uh, it's their technology. I mean, it's not that we, um, I mean, we, we can't go there and, and take it. We could perhaps uh, uh, negotiate a way to share it. Uh, um, it's not about, I think, I think this is something I, um, I've been dealing with or I've been uh, engaging with like uh, irritatingly with it's not about engaging it with critically critically because maybe critique is not necessarily what is necessarily the structure uh, of exchange that uh, should lead this this this, this process but it's uh, it's uh, it's an exchange that it is possible um, and uh, and then this negotiation this this dance this exchange um, sometimes we may step on each other but that means that we can keep we need to keep on dancing carrying the other for longer um, I think that this is um, all I can say to wrap things up. Uh, um, but in a way that I think that it hopefully just opens things up. Yeah. Thank you very much, Pablo. Uh, I don't have many questions here from people, but I will try to bring at least a couple of them. But before that, I would like to engage the four of you in a conversation that in a way comes directly from the, the, the words of Paul Preciado in relation to the Somatec. Uh, in that context, what I would like to know is to what extent uh, the digital world and the technologies of our time considering uh, surveillance state, considering the way we depend at this point uh, in our daily life since we wake up uh, for technology. Alexa, light the lights. Okay. And she said, okay. Uh, we have a, G, a, a GPS to control our uh, space while we drive. We are constantly uh, surveyed by all these cameras all around us, wherever we go. Uh, of course, I'm not talking about certain spaces in Africa or in Latin America or in Asia that unfortunately don't even have even computers yet, but in, in, cons in considering the idea that Paul is bringing up that I, that I find fascinating um, and revolutionary, I think that I don't have very clear how do you see and in what context, uh, in what context do you uh, understand these issues that I'm bringing up and also how the somatic war 
uh, I mean, the somatic body or the somatic is translate itself into the digital realm. It's a question for all of you, actually. Shall I say something first? Since basically you're referring to to what I uh, to what I was saying. Um, well, I I could say two things. I could say that uh, we and, and maybe this is related to what everyone has been saying before, including uh, recently, like Pablo that was speaking about um, dance as a technology of uh, both gender and, and social production. I, I think that the, I mean, a, a technology, digital technologies are not more technological than other technologies that we've been using historically. <laughs> they, they are just the technology that the prim, primary uh, kind of, let's say, control and surveillance technology of contemporary times. But they are not, uh, I mean, all of, social, different social technologies have been historically contributing to constructing different bodies and basically either acting upon bodies through violence or given uh, sovereignty and political recognition to other bodies as we were discussing be before with Okui, right? So what my, as let's say kind of a hist from a historical and kind of philosophical point of view, but I, what I could say is that at least until the, the Second World War, uh, the, these political technologies that were acting upon the body and producing like certain bodies as objects or certain bodies as just like a, a disposable material and certain bodies as, as subjects, these technologies until the, 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 the Second World War were mostly um, what I would call external, external political technologies, meaning they were like physical apparatuses, including, for instance, architecture, including uh, the, the tailorizing machine, including, uh, in, you know, like mechanical devices in which the body come to be inserted, right? So in a sense, or even I, I can give you other examples, right? For instance, uh, for if you're thinking about the, the, uh, the working class body or the way in which the uh, slavery was, was working as well, uh, the, the physical concrete body had to be uh, inserted within a certain uh, chain of production, right? and physically so the same would could be said for for the school the same could be said could be said for uh let's say the the hospital or the prison in which basically the physical body has to go into an architecture of power to be the object of a certain violence and to for for a certain subjectivity to be produced well am i making sense with this like you understand what i what i mean right I think that what is changing now is that uh, from the, the this Second World War up to now, technologies, political technologies of control and production of subjectivity had, had been miniaturized. They've been uh, transformed into a digital, chemical, bio te technological devices. And now, instead, instead of being the body that is going through those technologies of power, we actually take these technologies of power into the body. You, you see what I mean, right? So that's a, it's a completely different uh, relationship to it, because we're not. It's not a, a relationship of, of exteriority or externality. We do not relate to them, and we cannot oppose to them. Basically, as saying we oppose to the. Uh, I don't know, we approach to, to prison as a technology. Well, now it's more complicated because we have this thing, which is basically uh, almost has become uh, an, a kind of a, an attached organ to oneself because we are constantly in relation to it, right? Or even the way, for instance, um, digital technologies have fully 
has been have been fully inf infiltrated within the domestic space, which until now was supposed to be, which is completely fake, but anyway, was supposed to be a kind of a private space. We know historically and even more from feminist and anti anti racist traditions that the domestic space is a space of violence, of course. But until now, at least that violence was mostly colonial and patriarchal. Now it's also the violence of the state, right? Uh, that is basically circulated, and I would say as well the market, right? That is is coming through those technologies. So that's I think that that's what what is um, given like even even more complexity to the the contemporary uh, both construction of the the political body and. Uh, complexity as well of the techniques of resistance to it, right? Because in a sense, it's not that we have uh, completely abandoned the uh, architectures of power of the disciplinary colonial times. No, those architectures of power are there. Uh, prisons are still there. Uh, let's say uh, in, in a certain kind of uh, industrial production and industrial and ecological destruction is still there. Uh, but on top of those technologies, in a sense, like a, almost like embedded and establishing a new an alliance with it, we have this new set of technologies that I, I have called for the, for, for the better or for the worse, it could be described in many other words, but I, I have called them pharmacopornographic in the sense precisely, and that was like very much intending to underline precisely the position that the body takes in relation to them. Uh, both they are biochemical, they, they uh, go directly into the, even into the DNA, if you want, of each of, uh, if each of the singular bodies, into the very materiality of those bodies. And at the same time, in terms of the technologies of vision, and that's why I was speaking at the beginning of, the, of our discussion today, I was speaking of anatomy, because in a sense what we have now with the, um, with the, the, the internet, is the, the full expansion of this regime of anatomic vision that we had at the, at, that started at the, in the 15th century, but that now is like going, is, is taking like an enormous global proportions, right? And that can go, can take like the totality of the planet and the singularity of a, of a single cell both things at the same time. And at the same time, we all, each of us will have one of these devices in the pocket, right? So I think that we are in a, in a, in a context that is of an enormous complexity, of an enormous complexity. But at, at the same time, I also want to stress this because I think that all of us we've been today like fighting with the sense of a, uh, you know, of like being hopeless and, and um, not understanding what's going on in the world and everything. At the same time, um, I, I, I do think that um, we are in a moment of, of both epistemological and political shift. And that these technologies of production of subjectivity, these technologies of construction of who are the bodies that matter? Who are the bodies that do not matter? Those technologies are mutating and shifting. And I think that never before, and I think this is good for us to understand this today, a day like today, never before we've been, we had the possibility of uh, collectively uh, participating into this construction. I don't know if this moment of participa participating into this construction will last long, <laughs> or if this, this will be like a moment of, you know, blackout and then <laughs> suddenly like we just like uh, fully, all of us fully disconnected. I think this is important for us to know that even what we're doing today, for instance, like the kind of, of, of uh, discussion that we're having today, uh, we have to pay attention to that and think that this was not possible in the, in, the, in the 1960s. This was impossible. This was a completely impossible, like basically like bodies that were considered like to be uh, racialized, a, a trans person, uh, someone that comes from, that has been considered like uh, indigenous or whatever. I mean, this was completely um, impossible. Right, so I do think that it's important to acknowledge that what we are living today is already a revolution and that everything else that is happening is a counter revolution to this revolution that is already happening because otherwise we're lost. Otherwise we just like, uh, you know, but of course I do just to go back to the question, I do uh, think that is of course the, the, um, 
these mutating technologies of production of subjectivity and of production of the body are giving us, of course, a lot of trouble. Uh, it will be like a, a new, a full new context for the struggle, but also are giving us many other possibilities uh, for um, collectively thinking and, and acting as has never been possible before, right? So, well, maybe I went already for too long. It's like 520. No, but what about, what but, about? But are you talking, but I, I was just, are you speaking of, I mean, because I do think like this digital cyberspace, right? Gives the potential for the creation of a very, very, um, a huge and diverse and complicated body that can find a kind of singular, can find um, like, cause that's what we're seeing when George Floyd happened. And then we started to see an explosion of movements um, from across the Literally. European Union to the Americas, you know, and, and also now we're even seeing in Nigeria, you know, um, the ability of um, the, the women who are leading this movement against police brutality to project what's mm -hmm. happening, to try to, 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 to document it. I mean, so there is this kind of growing global solidarity, but my concern though is that these sort of corporate um, spaces that created these platforms when like to sort of, I feel like we are sort of relying on um, some sense of good and ethical judgment, but from people whose ultimate concern is capital creation and um, capture. And so if, but in these platforms, if people can continually elude that or, you know what I mean? So this is, this is my question around this sort of new, this formation of this kind of global social body, as you say, Paul, that was really almost impossible back in the 60s, but people did it, right? But you had to fly, like, you know, Malcolm flying to Africa to meet, really? you know, Patrice Lumumba or even Nina Simone in her travels throughout the Caribbean and, um, and Africa. But, my, but, but then there's the question though of, um, again, I have to come back to sensation. And I think that across these spaces, what concerns me is a loss of sensation, is a loss of almost a kind of electrical charge that we receive and get from each other to continually power each other, right? Because ultimately people had to get on the streets and be near each other. So, so you know what I mean? There is a kind of quality to, um, to aliveness um, mm -hmm. um, and all of it, that sort of messiness, the way it exceeds what might be the kind of constraints of an algorithm <laughs> that, we, that we need and rely on. And so I'm always concerned about, I, I, I wonder about, I mean, or I'm, I'm very excited that people understand this clearly, but um, the longer we stay in these boxes and have to separate from each other in order to protect each other, in order to ensure our continuing life, um, what, what, are, what are we losing around that kind of, what are we losing about the sort of that, that charged negative space from between bodies, right? Yeah. Uh, I have a nine-year-old daughter and the other day she was actually with Siri, she was like, Siri, tell me a joke. And, Siri says, you know, why do I hate car keys? Why? And she says, because it's always starting something, right? So, and then she went into a series of knock-knock jokes with Siri, you know? And it's so interesting though, there is this like hope and desire for embodiment, especially among young kids, like, or my daughter is always looking for a way to prove that Siri is actually, there's a soul, there's something. Um, so this is interesting, like this desire and how, this space, I'm, I'm not quite understanding or I'm missing that part. Mm. Well, maybe someone else, someone else wants to say something because I don't want to take a hold on the, on the discussion, even though there are like so many fascinating Regina. questions. Regina. Uh, is, is opening Regina. up. Regina. Respondo en español y me van a ayudar a traducir. So I will respond in Spanish and I will have help translating. Sí, un poco lo que decía Paul, sí es un momento en la historia fundamental. Yes, just like Paul was saying, this is a moment uh, in history that's fundamental. En primer lugar, creo que esta situación de este mundo paralelo digital básicamente pone en evidencia lo que Paul afirmaba, que el cuerpo va más allá del orgánico y del físico. En this, uh, necesito que me repitas un poco, Regina. Um, in, um, in this paradigmal, like, or maybe I can try to say it in English. In the first, in, 
in the first moment, I said Paul has reason when he says that the body is more than the physical and the organic part. And, and in this moment, in this historical moment, it's crucial to understand that. And uh, yo tengo mucha fe pensando que hay todo un movimiento paralelo que sucede fuera de esta burbuja digital. I have a lot of faith. I have a lot of faith thinking that there is a lot of movement outside of this paradigmal world. Eh, considero que el capitalismo ha hecho un perfecto trabajo de hipercontrol hacia la clase social que tenemos acceso a este mundo digital. Es el mundo digital que han construido para nosotros y nosotras. Pero hay un mundo más allá de esta caja. I consider that capitalism has created hyper control, has done a great job at creating this hyper control of the digital world. There But is there is something else outside. beyond. Creo que el mundo jamás estuvo tan dividido y tan clasificado como lo está en este momento. Es decir, los grupos excluidos están en este momento más excluidos que nunca. Y sin embargo, yo conservo la fe que son estos grupos excluidos, estas comunidades indígenas originarias, de donde va a venir la verdadera revolución. Mientras nosotros permanecemos en estas cajitas digitales, en este mundo construido para nosotros, hay un movimiento que se construye sin nosotros y con una fuerza y que posiblemente de ese movimiento venga el cambio. I think the world has never been as decided as it is now. I think the excluded groups and marginalized people are more excluded and marginalized than ever. But I consider these people, the indigenous people, for example, uh, that this is where the revolution will come from and that this is where the movement will come. And I have a lot of faith. In Guatemala, for example, hay un movimiento importantísimo que se llama CODECA, que ha surgido de movimientos indígenas campesinos que tienen muchos años de estar luchando y han logrado todo un movimiento que sigue funcionando más allá de esta burbuja digital y utilizan esta herramienta digital simplemente para llegar más allá, pero toda su lucha sigue sucediendo fuera de esta pantalla. En Guatemala, por ejemplo, hay un movimiento, ¿cómo se llama otra vez, por favor? CODECA. There is a movement called CODECA that is made up of rural people, farmers that function outside of the technological bubble and they're fighting outside of these boxes and they're bringing hope to us all. Y para el resto de mortales que sí pertenecemos a esta burbuja digital, creo que es el momento clave para entender que somos más allá de este físico. Es hablemos de un cuerpo holístico, hablemos de energía, hablemos de la posibilidad, de la fuerza, de la lucha que va más allá de esta piel. Uh, the rest of us mortars, mortals who belong to this technological bubble, it is time for us to see and to show that there is more than this physical body, that we exist more than this technological space. Eh, evidentemente, el gobierno de Guatemala y del mundo me pueden controlar y me pueden obligar a permanecer en mi casa detrás de esta pantalla, pero no me pueden obligar a dejar mi lucha. Nadie lo va a Evidently, Guatemala's government and the world can make me stay home, but nobody, not, not any government, not anybody can take ownership over my body and make me stop fighting and make me uh, stop looking for the truth. Um, I think in relation to this, uh, one thing that we've been talking about uh, here in, in Rio, but also some colleagues, is a certain responsibility of, of, uh, of institutional uh, institutions to figure out ways of being together um, and this this becomes even more uh, urgent uh, after the, the pandemic you know? uh, I mean that, that because because it's not about I mean it can't be about uh, let's lock ourselves up until it goes it's about how can we constantly invent ways of being together with care what I, I, I mean what are those uh, What are those with children? What are those with adults? What, I mean, what, what technologies, in fact, can we implement as professionals, as, as people who work with art and people who work with institutions and people who, who are, have a, a certain access to vocabularies and, and, and histories to, to invent ways to come, of coming together? Um, I mean, maybe right now we can't, uh, you know, go into that space. Maybe, maybe we have to, as, as happened with the So I mean, how can we combine this? We have to with 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 the care, 
And I think it's, it's a super, I mean, it's almost like a, um, it's a responsibility that is that, that mobil mobilizes. I mean, I feel like this is almost like something like a purpose. I mean, it gives us a purpose. I mean, here in the museum, we're thinking about that all the time. I mean, how can we actually make a safe space for people to get together? I mean, why, what is that safe space today? Um, what, you know, what, depending on the people. And I think that's a, that's a super nice challenge uh, to think about. I, I wanted to say that unfortunately I'm gonna have to leave. Uh, so, and I, it's, it's such a pity because I love discussing with you and I could have spent here like all, all, all day, but I, I have to, I have to go. So I gonna have to say goodbye. And I just wanted to say bye as well to everyone that is connected. I didn't want to say just like disappear then and, and then you don't see me anymore <laughs> on, on the screen. Thank you so much. And I, I would love to continue debating with you and, and I admire you so much as artists and, and curators and everyone. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. Have Thank a good you one. so much, Paul. Thank you. It was great talking to you, Okwe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pablo and Regina, Octavio. Thanks. I love you. Thank you. Uh, let me see if we have any other questions that we haven't uh, answered. Uh, I believe that most of the issues that... Uh, well, in a way we have been dealing with all these issues, but continuing with the conversation that we left before, uh, my other preoccupation is artificial technology. It's continuing with this, but in a different way. What I understand as the obliteration of the body, the disappearance of the body within technology uh, is not anymore like interference, is not anymore like in the sense we, we understand surveillance, in the same we are we understand nanotechnology in the, um, biological weapons and whatever. Uh, this is beyond. This is beyond because we are not part of, of, of the picture in artificial technology. Uh, not necessarily always, but uh, that is something that concerned me in relation to uh, body politics and the way we deal with our body in relation to the forces of terror that have been gathering all over the world already to obliterate so much of the population and to bring uh, a neo-fascist regime everywhere. I, I actually think that that's the most, that's the fright, most frightening and actually legitimate scenario moving forward. I think that as corporations find ways to like um, to let not need human bodies to carry out their production of capital. Um, we're, I mean, we're seeing that that's, that's what's happened. That's why the body is under stress. And I think it's almost like the, the, uh, the deprivileging of labor or the, the, the like the, the bodies, the number of bodies that become excess, excessive bodies. Um, I mean, I think that's why we're also seeing, you know, what's going to happen. My concern is that how deeply entrenched are these powers and in a global way to continue to destroy the, ra the rainforests in Brazil, to continue to, you know, mine for oil in the, the Delta region where um, they are polluting and um, making um, the world in uninhabitable for most bodies while they find their protective exclusive spaces. So, I mean, that's when you say that question, this is the thing that I think about and, it, and, and, and worry about, um, which again, then feels like Pablo, when you said, how do we find the need to find more ways to come together with care, to be next to each other in body is, is kind of critical. So I'm, I'm not really even, I don't, sorry, I don't feel like Octavio, I don't know that I'm totally addressing what you're saying, but I'm just 
reiterating it as a concern and a fear. Um, I, 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 I just simply ask the question because it seems to me that we are entering a, a very, very challenging times of dystopia. Um, and I don't know how, how far is, is this is going to go, but definitely, uh, as Regina says, and, and Pablo also mentioned, uh, we are living, uh, there is a, an incredible amount of people, uh, in, in indigenous people that have been erased while we speak. Uh, is, uh, and we have to, and I know that this is part of, of, of of an entire policy of extermination, exterminating uh, human beings, bodies, um, is happening all the time. It's true through through the history of the 20th century. We have seen that in many other fashion, many other ways. But what is happening today is with the technology that we have and the means of of and power of big. Cor in, uh, 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 global corporations, we are all living under the same uh, uh, fears um, and uncertainty. But I don't have uh, I don't have answers. I'm just worried about it. Uh, uh, the more I I project myself into some kind of a future, I realize that the the most important issue to believe in a future is a sense of utopia. But at this point, for the last 50 years, this, the idea of, of utopia have been completely, uh, have completely disappeared because we don't have actually the means to uh, understand the, the dichotomy between reality and our dreams, let's call it. Our, right. uh, uh, there is no more. Before we have a projection into the future, and it was, let's call the communist revolution or the messianic idea of salvation or whatever. But these days after what, have we, what we have seen all over the world with wars, with uh, slavery, racism, uh, from my perspective, everything is going the other, in the other direction. Well, uh, I feel like, so yes. The, I feel like this yeah, idea of the messianic savior, unfortunately, that still exists. That's the one that still exists. I mean, and that's the sickness that we're seeing, right? The people are still waiting for literally a white man to emerge from the skies. Yeah, and, you're right. And, you're and, right. and help, help them move, help them get to death, right? They're, they're afraid. They want somebody to walk them. Um, they don't, definitely don't want to die the way the migrants are dying trying to cross the borders or the people that don't have access to water or education um, in different villages, say in Nigeria. Yes, they don't want to die that way. You know what I mean? Even though when you look at some of the communities here in this country and you see the opioid crisis, you see them without health care. You see, do you know what I mean? They, they, they still want to separate their bodies from you know, the people that they, you know, the, the people that they deprivilege or don't consider important, but they don't realize that they're actually living in the, uh, in the same level of precarity from these people, but they do believe that there's ultimately a white man that's going, that's saving them. It's going to make their, their lives means, and their deaths manageable. That means from my perspective, and I want to end up in an optimistic way, uh, that we have a lot of work to do. Oh, so yes. no matter what happened, we, we are not here to just uh, have a, a, a happy dance, but we, 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 we are not probably built to confront all these painful times that we have been living under, uh, but we have to learn to deal with that. Uh, we have been learning for the last four years to deal with chaos and with a monster. But unfortunately, we cannot just stay uh, away from, from our daily reality and to understand that there is a lot of people that depend on us and our ideas, our, our work to continue. As Regina was saying, uh, she, she has faith in all other people that, that are not part of this uh, talk or, the, or the, they are not present in that way. 
uh, but they are bodies that we have to consider also that will help us to continue somehow. Yes. Magda? So <laughs> let me say, uh, Okui, Regina, Octavio, Pablo, and Paul that left a few minutes ago. Thank you, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you for this uh, uh, performativity of getting together. And I want to say about Regina coming back to Vanderbilt in the exact month, four years later. Uh, we talk about the body that born, live and died in geography. So there's no coincidence. There is a reason why we are getting together today here. I want to remind everyone that I born in 1959. 60 years after that, it was impossible to imagine a black woman from the diaspora speaking and organizing a conversation such as this one in Tennessee, in Nashville, in place when at that time, body were hanging from trees and people were removing from places in a brutal way. So the revolution that Paul was talking and the Oakley mentioned is in full blossom. And we are the children and this conversation is just a manifestation of the power of the body in geography and the power of the body with conviction. Let's still dream of justice. Let's still dream of solidarity. Let's still dream of equality. Still dream of human goodness. There is time when eyes get bloody. There are times when you cannot sleep and we are in this time. There are times we fear conquer, but the soul of the redeemers, the courage of tender heart with each one of you are, will always fire the forward path of the decent men and women of this land. In the spy of Trump, in the spy of crypto capitalism, in the spy of pharma porno, in the spy of injustice, we are moving forward. And this reunion is just a testament of what the body in geography and in performativity could do. We are moving forward. Do not despair and do not lose hope. I invite you to stay with us and to see la verdad, the true, the performance piece of Regina Jose Galindo, another testament of this. And do not forget to join us next week for chapter seven of EADJ, an institution that is already dreaming the future. Thank you. Regina. Gracias. Eh, pues quiero cerrar primero agradeciendo por el espacio eh, dejarlos con una nota alta, decirles que nunca antes eh, estuvimos tan controlados, nunca antes el capitalismo hizo tan bien trabajo de tenernos laborando sin marcar tarjeta de entrada y salida. En algún momento, nosotras y nosotros tendremos que tomar el control de nuestras vidas y dejar que esta tecnología eh, siga controlándonos. Y voy a cerrar con un video que se llama La Verdad. Es un performance realizado en el 2013, en el que leo continuamente testimonios de mujeres indígenas mayas que sufrieron violencia sexual durante la guerra en Guatemala. En esta acción, un, eh, un médico me inyecta anestesia cada 10 minutos, intentando doblegarme, y yo sigo hablando y hablando, hablando y contando la verdad a pesar de las dificultades. La verdad es un homenaje a estas mujeres por su lucha, por haber contado su historia una y otra vez. Y es un homenaje a este juicio que ganamos en el 2013. No importa que las familias oligarcas en Guatemala hayan logrado que ese juicio se anulara. No importa que el gobierno de Estados Unidos haya apoyado que ese juicio se cancelara. La verdad salió a luz y nada ni nadie podrá negarla. Muchas gracias.
¡Ay, Dios! En la aldea murieron 95 hombres, 41 mujeres, 47 niños. Por el censo que sacaron es que se sabe la cantidad que murieron. Hay hombres que los colgaron. A mi hermana, que estaba embarazada, solo la abrieron. Le sacaron al bebé y lo amarraron. Y hay quienes, hay quienes se juntaron y se juntaron a hacer fuego y los pusieron a asar. Y así, asados, se los comieron. Los que fueron se mancharon de sangre de los cadáveres. Hay quienes no comieron, los enterraron detrás de la escuela. Eso fue duro. Se llegaron a meter en la casa, lo amarraron y no, no quiero, casi no quiero recordar porque es que lo amarraron, lo amarraron con un palo y se lo llevaron. Con nosotras de verdad fue dura la violencia, por eso es que no se puede olvidar todo ese tiempo, porque fue mucho. Para las mujeres fue diferente que para los hombres, porque a las mujeres primero las agarran, pasan sus ganas con ellas y después de eso, después les dan la muerte. Dos delitos hacen, en cambio con los hombres los dejan de una vez torturados o con bala, los matan, pero la mujer, la mujer sufre primero. Hasta después que se quitan las ganas, la dejan muerta. Me rodearon mi casa, entraron conmigo en la casa y ya no pude salir. Yo me quedé violada en medio de los dos. Tu esposo no murió, me dijeron. Encontró una casa mejor, te dejó. Ellos me violaron después de decirme eso. Seguro ellos se llevaron a mi esposo. También sacaron a mis hijos afuera. A mí me dejaron encerrada juntamente con ellos adentro y me violaron. Me dolía, me duele. Todo lo que pasó es doloroso. Quemaron mi casa, quemaron mis cosas, quemaron mi casa, me violaron. Entre las piedras en el barranco, allí juntábamos el fuego con mi mamá. Fue costoso en ese tiempo. Cuando aumentó más la violencia, los soldados nos agarraban y nos llevaban al camposanto y nos decían, ahora mismo ustedes van a escarbar los hoyos porque ustedes tienen armas. A mí muchas viudas nos llevaron y como a las 12, 12 de la mañana nos soltaban y nos íbamos a nuestras casas. Seguido luego, nos volvían a reunir y nos llevaban nuevamente a que nos escarbáramos los hoyos y nos decían, esos van a ser sus hoyos, esas van a ser sus casas, y nos ponían a dar vueltas alrededor de los hoyos. Decíamos nosotras para nosotras mismas, segurito nos van a matar, y llorábamos, y hacíamos los hoyos, pero no nos mataron. No lo hicieron, puro susto. Fue tremendo lo que pasamos. A mi esposo lo llegaron a sacar a la casa en la noche. Él se escondió, pero lo encontraron. Solo su suéter pudo sacar. Iba descalzo, sin camisa. Solo su pantalón se puso. A mí me pegaron con el fusil cuando amaneció. Y yo fui a llevarle la comida a mi esposo pero no me dejaron pasar. Ya va a regresar tu esposo, me dijeron. Un señor se acercó y me dijo que él me podía ayudar a sacar a mi esposo, pero que yo tenía que coger con él, tenía que ser su amante. Fui con mi suegra y le conté. Ella me dijo que aceptara para salvar la vida de su hijo. Pero el señor solo me engañó. Como el teniente sabía que yo iba sola, me llevó al ejército 
y me dijo, Pero el Señor solo me engañó. Como el teniente sabía que yo estaba sola, me llevó al ejército y me dijo, aquí te quedas. Me puso pantaloneta y me sacaba a correr. Todos me molestaban cuando me miraban correr en pantaloneta. Yo vi que los tenían allá atrás de donde ellos dormían. Oía cómo se quejaban. Me llevó a correr a la laguna. Yo lloraba porque todo el pueblo me vio. Como yo no quería, me pegaba y me llevaba arrastrando. Después me escapé, me fui a vivir a la capital. Dejé a mis hijos con mi suegra. Me dijeron que si me quedaba, me podía matar. Fue así como me salvé. Me fui, me fui y ya no puedo regresar. A mediados del 82, cuando se quejaron de mí, se quejaron mucho de mí, tres veces me violaron. Me llevaron del, al destacamento y me dijeron, tenés armas, le das de comer a los guerrilleros. Yo les dije, yo no tengo armas y dijeron que me iban a matar. Te vamos a matar, me dijeron. Yo lo que hice fue llevar cargado en mi espalda a mi hijo. Si me matan, no me van a matar solo a mí. Yo no voy a abandonar a mi hijo. Hubo alguien que fue. Dijo a los soldados que yo era la que hacía las tortillas para los soldados, para los otros. Y señalaron mi casa. Señalaron mi casa que queda del otro lado del lago. Ahí es donde atiendo. Y entonces ahí llegaron los soldados y me agarraron y me violaron. Al día siguiente, al amanecer, ya los soldados estaban en las casas, violentaron todas las puertas. A mi mamá, ya era grande mi mamá, la amarraron contra un palo y las vacas se la llevaron. No podíamos hacer nada, solo estábamos esperando la muerte. Estábamos vigilados. No podíamos hacer nada. Cuando íbamos a escribir su nombre, cuando llegamos al pueblo, ya estaban los soldados y dijeron, allá viene mi hijo, viene mi patojo. Y cuando llegué, me desataron el niño en la espalda y se juntaron y me dijeron que me iban a quitar el niño. Me dijeron agarrar el dinero y yo dije, no, yo no doy mi hijo. Y me dijeron, ¿qué viene a hacer aquí entonces? Y mi cuñado dijo que veníamos a escribir al niño. Y los soldados me preguntaron que qué nombre le habíamos buscado. Y le dije que Jacob. Ese no es su nombre. Ellos le buscaron el nombre al niño. Y nosotros no queríamos. Pero ellos le pusieron Rigoberto. Entraron y dijo el alcalde que entregara al niño. Que no les dije yo, no les dejo a mi niño, es mío. Tal vez es mentira lo que van a hacer y lo van a tirar al barranco y yo no lo doy. Cuerpos quemados, mujeres con palos atravesados y enterrados, como si fueran para cocinar, listos, listos para cocinar como carne asada. Todos doblados y niños masacrados y bien picados con machetes. Las mujeres también bien matadas, bien picadas. Yo, desde pequeña estaba trabajando en la capital. Yo no vi eso que cuentan de las masacres. No lo viví, no lo vi. Después, cuando yo vine, 
ya habían hecho todo eso. Cuando yo vine a mi casa, me dice mi mamá que esto y eso pasó. Yo estaba en la capital trabajando. Salió el año que yo había trabajado y me dieron mis vacaciones. Entonces me vine y ya estaba medio calmado esa cosa. Pero mejor me fui, me voy. Pues siquiera uno de mis ocho días, dije yo. Pero lamentablemente por esas vacaciones me vine a caer. Estaba yo ocho días en mi casa cuando llegaron otra vez. Y ese día estaba yo torteando. Como a las dos menos veinte, tal vez. Solo estaba yo torteando. Ay, Dios. Y me llevaron a mí. Y me empujaron así, y me empujaron. Me empujaron con las armas, uno adelante y otro atrás. Y cuando sentí, me metieron adentro de ese cuarto. Ya cuando sentí, me hicieron eso. Como a las dos de la tarde, empezaron a sacar a las mujeres en grupos de 10 y 20. Algunas se escaparon hacia sus casas, donde fueron violadas, quemadas, quemadas junto a sus casas. Eran muchos los otros. Se dirigieron rumbo allá al Toyá y encontraron a las mujeres a quienes violaron y mataron. En Yalambojosh se quedaron cuatro días. Forzaron a la gente a participar en varias reuniones para organizar patrullas. Al día siguiente hicieron un hoyo y metieron allí bombas. Las estallaron. Muchas mujeres huyeron con los niños de la comunidad. Luego de haber sido violadas, algunas lograron huir a poca distancia. Otras violadas, ejecutadas, se quedaron allí. A las mujeres les encerraron con los niños y los ancianos en otra casa. Metieron bomba y quemaron. A todos los quemaron vivos. No se me olvida, una intentó escapar de la gran llamarada Salió corriendo de la gran llamarada, pero la agarraron y le sacaron el corazón. Cuando esas personas hicieron la masacre con mi esposo y mi hijo, unos estaban haciendo la masacre en otras cosas. Uno estaba matando a mi hijo, yo viendo, los otros me estaban violando. Pero yo los vi, vi a mí, a mi hijo tirado ahí, con unas semejantes heridas que tenía. Ay, mi chamaco, él estaba torturado con sus cachetillos allí, quitados, se los quitaron los cachetillos. Y mi esposo allí, a la par tirados, los dos. Mi esposo tenía un leño cruzado en la nuca, con un lazo y lleno de pucha, puñaladas que tenía el corazón. Y yo violada, ¿qué me importaba? El animador de la iglesia, a mi cuñado, así también lo sacaron. Ahí lo sacaron ellos. Yo no pensé que les hicieran algo. Dejaron que se persignaron, porque todavía no había terminado la celebración. Así que dejaron que se persignaran, que terminaran y después los mataron. Uy, cuántos balazos le dieron. Saber ni de cuántos balazos murieron. Así pasó todo eso. Así murió el esposo y el esposo de mi hermana. Mi cuñado tocaba la guitarra. Hermanos del papá de mi cuñada, el hermano de su esposo y mi hermana, el papá, el otro hermano, también murió. Todos los hombres de esa celebración los mataron. En la casa de una señora que estaba en la celebración, ahí hubo eso, ahí pasó. Fue en la tarde, como a las siete. Cuando vieron que estábamos reunidos, rodearon la casa donde estábamos. No terminamos de leer la lectura cuando oímos que decían, que salgan los hombres, que se queden las mujeres, 
Y entonces... El animador sacó su libro, se salió, pero en eso nos encerraron. Ya no nos dimos cuenta de los hombres. Yo ya no me di. Me sentía como muerto. Ha ah, oído otras señoras que se sacaron junto conmigo. A otra señora como de 40 la sacaron junto conmigo. La violaron a mi par. Eso fue atrás de la casa. Después de quemar la casa, hicieron lo que quisieron hacer conmigo. Me violaron, yo no sé cuántos. Después me soltaron y me quedé entre ellos. Yo ya no me fijé si lo sacaron a los hombres o no. Yo estaba así, usada. Después que quemaron las casas, me quedé entre ellos. Hay quienes los veían y reconocían. Son bastantes. Ellos fueron los que me vieron, me sacaron y me usaron. Cuando ella fue en el refugio, en el camino, quedó ella en un lugar con su esposo una noche. No solo ellos son, es un grupo. Y cuando escucharon la bamba, la bomba, las balas, ¡ay Dios, me asusté! Ahí vienen los soldados, dijeron ellos. Y entonces vinieron, y lo único que lograron agarrar fue a mi bebé. Y no lo hallo, no hay en qué camino agarraron. Mi hermanita fue capturada por un soldado, la desnudó, la violó a ella y la golpeaba. Ay, pero qué golpes le daba, y era chiquita. Y después se la llevaron a mi hermanita. Entonces, pues ellos llevaban a mi hermano a una aldea, que como quien dice, mira, mira lo que venimos a traer, mira el trofeo. Y así como quien dice, mostrar aquí quiénes son las familias que están con la guerrilla, porque tenían a la hermanita. Y la violaban y la torturaban. No una vez. Y la llevaban con ellos para mostrársela a la gente. Y le ponían un arma en su mano. Y le pusieron un vestido. Después de hacerle todo eso a la niña, le pusieron su vestido. Huí con mis hijitas entre el monte, hasta llegar a los refugios de la frontera. Pero en el camino nos alcanzaron los soldados y me separaron de mis hijitas. Ay, mis hijitas, ellas por un lado y yo por otro. Nos acusaban de guerrilleras y nos golpearon. Por la noche nos escapamos hasta llegar a los refugios. Durante todos esos días y todas esas noches me violaron. Y yo sé, pienso en mi corazón, que a mis hijitas también. Pero ¿dónde estarán mis hijitas? No aguanto, no aguanto de contar porque es que duele, son muy dolorosos, dolorosos son los recuerdos. Todo lo que sufrieron nuestros maridos, los arrastraban en el suelo como chuchos, amarradas las manos y los pies. Yo me agarré a valor y me fui al destacamento y pregunté. Y yo les dije, ¿no han visto a mi esposo por aquí? 
Yo tengo también mis hijos con él, estoy casada con él y quiero que lo dejen salir porque es mi marido y tenemos hijos. Él no tiene problemas, él prestó servicio militar. Hace menos de tres semanas terminó su servicio militar. Pero ellos no me quisieron escuchar. Y me dijeron, venga aquí. Y me agarraron la mano. Y ahí mismo me metieron al destacamento. Y me violó el soldado, el que me atendió. Y luego llamó a otros soldados. Y todos me violaron. Y mi esposo tampoco apareció. Ni apareció. Y yo toda violada. Al cabo de unos días, el ejército se los llevaba en un tractor, los ejecutaban y los hacían desaparecer. Ay, no, cómo duele. Ya se lo habían llevado a mi esposo. Ya estaba yo la con la tristeza. ¿Qué si en eso llegan? Llegan a mi casa. Yo me la pasaba llorando, de miedo, pero llegan, yo no podía hacer nada. Y ahí estaban mis niños en mi casa, y ahí me agarraron los soldados, ahí, ahí enfrente de mis hijos. Y cómo gritaban y gritaban y gritaban y lloraban de miedo. Yo lo vi tirado. Sí, yo lo vi tirado, lo vi tirado mientras los opilotes se lo estaban comiendo. Qué matazón que hubo allá con nosotros, qué matazón. A una le quitaron el bebé, ah pobre mujer. ¿Cómo hace una pobre mujer con eso? Eso ya no son gente, eso es puro infierno. Si le agarraron al bebé y lo estrellaron. La pobre mujer se murió después, el bebé estrellado. Eso fue tremendo. Y, ay, Dios mío, ¿cómo será la muerte si esa muestra que nosotros hemos visto es fea? Le tiraron sobre el niño, usted todo tapado la boca, todo tapado los ojos, y un cuchillazo por aquí, ve, y otro balazo por allá, ve. Y al bebé lo metieron entre una como esparadrapo grande. Allí lo envolvieron. Y ahí se quedó, pobrecito. Pobrecito ese bebé. Sabe ni de quién era ese bebé. Se podía ver cómo las golpeaban en el vientre con las armas. O las acostaban. ¿Sabe qué? Una vez vi, los soldados le brincaban encima, en la barriga, saber ni cuántos meses tenía. Le saltaban encima una y otra vez, y la mujer gritaba y gritaba, hasta que el niño salió como una pepita, todo malogrado salió. Yo lo vi, le introdujeron el arma en la vagina, grandota. Y así le mataron al feto. Salía, pero ¡ah! Sangre salía y cosas que salían de ahí por ella. Y después, después de eso ella estaba viva. Y le metieron el pedazo de la cabeza de un hombre que acababan de matar. Fue 15 de julio del 82 en Salamabaj, en Quiché. La familia entera huía. Estábamos refugiados en una casa. Pero llegaron. Los encontraron y nos encontraron. Lo primero que hicieron fue coger a la mamá, violarla, uno tras otro, enfrente de toda la familia. Y luego cogieron a las niñas, una por una, desde la chiquitilla que tenía nueve años de, Dios, de nueve años de edad. Prendieron la casa. Allí nadie murió. Todos sobrevivimos.
Habían diez verdugos. Hacían turnos para matar a la gente. Mientras cinco mataban a unos, cinco se dedicaban a descansar. Y cuando tenían descanso, les daban turnos. Les daban turnos para violar a las niñas y a las señoritas. Luego de violarlas, las dejaban estancadas, les metían palos en los genitales. Era pareja usted. La tortura era pareja. Lo que tenía la pobre mujer es que lo primero que hacían era violarla. Después, ya después de violarla, pues ya la torturaban. Pero después de que todos los oficiales, los, sus, sus instructores, y a todos después de haber abusado y de que se le venían encima, después la torturaban y después le daba muerte. Sí, eso era parejo. Yo me sentía muy mal. Pensaba muchas cosas. En momentos que pensé golpearlo, pero no podía, porque él cargaba su arma. Le tuve miedo porque si le golpeaba me podía matar en ese momento. Uy, sí, así que me dejé. Yo tenía mucho miedo. Si no te vas a dejar, yo te entrego a manos de los que tienen armas, me dijeron. Dijeron ellos. En propio idioma mío me decían. Bueno, digo yo, ¿cómo no voy a aceptar? Porque mi vida es la que estoy salvando. Por eso nosotros dábamos la comida. Por eso yo le daba toda la comida que me pedían, yo les preparaba, preparaba toda la comida. Y todos nuestros cuerpos se los daban, se los dábamos. Si no, nos mataban. Fue duro. Yo después me sentía mal. Cuando ya pasó, cuando me pasó, yo sentía que mejor me hubiera muerto, le decía yo a mi mamá y a mi papá. Mejor me hubieran matado. Yo no siento tranquilidad viviendo así. Esos problemas pues me llevó a punto de yo matarme debajo de un carro. ¿Para qué quiero yo una vida así? Siempre pensando en eso. ¿Para qué quiero yo mi vida así? La gente que lo juntaron allí, vinieron a ver. Y dijeron que para sacar, dice que lo sacaron otra vez. Pero mejor no, dijeron otros. Porque van a regresar otra vez los soldados y nos van a matar. Si, no, si ellos ven que nosotros vamos a sacar a esas mujeres, nos van a matar. Qué miedo teníamos como gente. No hubo respeto por la humanidad, ni por la vida. Robaron, mataron. A mi mamá le quitaron los senos con un cuchillo. Mi mamá, violada, sin senos, y la colgaron. Era muy triste, muy duro. Mujeres violadas con las estacas metidas. A nosotros nos habían dicho en la casa que nunca habláramos de nada. Aunque sepa algo, no hay que decir nada. Nunca diga nada. Y nosotros nunca dijimos nada. El ejército vino a San Juan de Titlán. Cuando llegaron ese día, yo tenía 10 años. Y yo escucho, recordé, cuando dijeron a los profesores, saquen a todas las niñas. Y así fue. 
para violarlas la sacaron a todas las niñas de la escuela eso fue muy duro ellos gritaban al principio los profesores no querían y decían si no sacan a las niñas vamos a meterle fuego a la escuela y se acaban todos aquí entonces un maestro nos sacó y salimos Éramos cuatro las que salimos primero. Éramos cuatro. Nos jalaron en el monte. Cinco fueron los que nos violaron. Cinco. Todos pasaron por todas. Y el profesor allí, mirando. Lo que pasó ese día fue como los diez de la mañana. Solo estuve llorando. Me preguntaron todo, todo. Me preguntaron por mi tía, por mi abuela, por mi papá. Que si yo sabía dónde estaban mis primos, mis sobrinos. Y nos encerraron a todos en la casa. Como ustedes no quieren decir dónde está el esposo ni los primos. Cerraron la puerta con mi abuelita ahí y nos dejaron ahí. Y nos agarraron a todas las mujeres. Eso fue lo que pasó ahí. Los ejércitos cuando encontraban una mujer la agarraban de la mano. Y ahí la empezaban a violar. Fueron muchas, muchas, muchas mujeres violadas. Cuando antes no teníamos el chorro de agua, miedo daba ir a traer el agua al río. Siempre regresaban violadas. Por ir a traer agua, siempre las perseguían. Estuvimos dos años juntos con las otras mujeres viudas y ahí nos pusimos a trabajar. El ejército nos puso a hacer su alimentación de ellos, pero después de los dos años no tuvimos, nos tuvimos que separar. Algunas se juntaron con otros hombres y se fueron y no sé hasta dónde. Y nosotras cinco tuvimos que quedarnos y aguantar. Dábamos el cuerpo y dábamos la comida. Y así aguantamos. Cuando se llevaron a mi esposa me quedé en manos de ellos. Entonces estuvimos moliéndole la tortilla, el maíz. Estuvimos manteniéndolos ahí en el destacamento. Les cocinábamos sus comidas. Les hacíamos sus tortillas. Y nos violaban. Nos violaban porque nos decían, ¿cómo va a pagar la comida y la tortilla que se está comiendo? En la montaña solo comíamos frutas de árboles que no se comen. Pero nosotros sí lo comemos porque no hay dónde ir a buscar comida. Hay algunos que tenían su siembra de maíz. Y cuando llegan los militares los arrancan y los tiran al suelo. Nos quitan toda la comida y la milpa. Y nosotros nos quedamos sin nada. El día que se llevaron a las 15 personas, entre hombres, mujeres, niños, encerraron a los hombres 
durante toda la noche en la iglesia. A las mujeres todas encerradas en la escuela. Ahí en la escuela, niñas, viejas, todas violadas en la escuela. Al anochecer, muchas mujeres nos acostumbramos a ir a escondernos con los niños en el monte para no ser violadas. Otras encontramos refugio en casas de vecinas, lejos, para no ser violadas. En una comunidad el ejército llamó a una reunión a todas las viudas después de haber desaparecido a sus esposos. A esas viudas ya las habían violado la primera vez cuando llegaron a su comunidad. Y después las llamaron todas, las reunieron a todas las viudas para una reunión. ¿Y qué si para violarlas era otra vez a todas las viudas cuando estaban reunidas? Ustedes se quedaron vivas, ustedes tienen la culpa. ¿Para qué se quedan vivas? Así dijo un general. ¿Para qué se quedó viva? Pues... Eso no es culpa mía, eso es culpa suya. ¿Quién la manda a quedarse viva? Esa es la ley. La ley es la ley que dice que usted cuida guerrilleros y por eso la ley nos mandó a matar gente. ¿Y a usted quién la manda a quedarse viva? El oficial tiene sus grupitos. Ese oficial, ese es el que le da las órdenes. Él decía, hoy va a degollar, o hoy decía, hoy va a guindar con alambres. Decía también, a todas esas muchachitas que están ahí, a violarlas. A veces daban las órdenes antes, a veces enfrente de uno. Ay, Dios, sí violaban a las mujeres. Eso era común. Lo normal era que por una pasaban 20, 30 soldados. Si la mujer caía bien, la dejaban ir, pero no caían bien. Generalmente las mataban. Después que pasaba el último, el enfermo, la mataban. Cuando nos encontraban a los hombres, nos llevaban a las mujeres a la cárcel. Como generalmente estábamos acompañadas de los hijos pequeños en la chicha, ellos también eran encarcelados con nosotros. Ah, pobres niños de la chicha. Siempre que nos violaban, ahí teníamos a los niños. En medio de las violaciones que cometían los soldados con nosotras, y los niños ahí prendidos a la chiche. Ya yo, como muerto me sentía. Hay otras señoras que sajaron junto conmigo. Tiene 40 días que se alivió. La sacaron junto conmigo. A ella también la violaron. Eso fue atrás, atrás de su casa. Después de quemar su casa, hicieron lo que quisieron con ella y también conmigo. Me soltaron, pero me quedé entre ellos. Yo no me fijé si a los demás lo sacaron o no. A las mujeres les pegaban mucho, las usaban y les pegaban. Yo me acuerdo que les decían, vacas, ¡Shh! vacas, vacas de potrero. A las 10 de la mañana, el oficial dijo, ¡Shh! 
Mejor repartir a las mujeres una para cada dos soldados. Estas mujeres van a hacer la comida y las demás es para aprovecharse. 15 días van a estar ustedes aquí. Y estos 15 días son sus vacaciones. Estos 15 días vamos a usarlas. Nos dicen que somos las caseras del ejército. Mi embarazo no es de mi marido. Y como mi embarazo no es de mi marido, es de los soldados, saber ni de cuál. Me consolé con Dios. A quienes me dijeron que lo regale o que lo mate. Y yo digo, ¿cómo lo voy a regalar? ¿Cómo lo voy a matar? Si es mi hijo. Mis niños van conmigo cuando voy al destacamento porque no hay con quién dejarlos, porque necesitan comer. Así fue cuando mis niños estaban conmigo, que siempre estaban conmigo. Y ese día estaban conmigo cuando me violaron. Yo iba allí cuando los del ejército me agarraron y empiezan mis niños a llorar. Lo vieron todo, pobres mis niños, pero nunca preguntaron. Nunca preguntaron, ni yo les conté, ni se habló. Cuando eso pasó, mis niños estaban chiquitos. Por eso yo digo en mi cabeza, para no sufrir, que no se recuerda. Si se recordaran, seguro me hubieran preguntado. Ya no se siente la vida de uno, si va a vivir o no. No se sabe si no va a vivir, solo temblando. Desde que eso pasó, se quedó el miedo. Porque solo se oye como que vienen y se siente uno como que se parte esa parte de aquí. Como que se le abre el corazón de uno. Y uno... Uno ya no tiene corazón. Sí. A veces pienso y digo, mejor me hubiera muerto. Porque estoy viva. Estoy sufriendo. Cuando me duermo por la noche, sueño y tengo... Buenos sueños. Salgo de la cama y me siento debajo de un árbol. Y digo, parezco loca. Sabe Dios cuándo me vaya mal. Y así me hicieron. Y así me hicieron. Estuve 15 días de hemorragia escurriendo, escurriendo. Cuando me violaron, 
Me tocaron la boca para no gritar. Y así embrocada, me estuvieron en el suelo. Y mis hijos, no me acuerdo. Se me quedó todo retronado. Me golpearon con la culeta, con la culata del arma. Mi pie derecho quedó lastimado. Todavía está herido. Como cuando eso me sucedió, me bañé, me eché crema. Hice un montón de cosas y tuve miedo a que mi cuerpo se quede infectado. Tuve miedo a que estuviera infectado. Me bañé y me curé con plantas. Hice un montón de cosas y gracias a Dios no hubo nada. Cuando me vino el dolor, creo que es el tendón que tengo dañado. Me da calambre la cintura y me llega al corazón. Cuando camino me da un golpe duro en el pie. Esto es porque me violaron. Voy a decir que ese dolor que tengo, que no puedo pasar, porque se quedó grabado en mi corazón, en mis sentimientos. Porque fíjate, porque en la guerra tuve un hijo en el camino, o sea, en el camino tuve un parto. Porque mi esposo lo mataron. Y entonces para irme a ver a mi esposo, y ya esa fecha que iba a tener parto, pues tengo que caminar cuatro horas en la casa, con el bebé en la mano, muerto. Ese es el rencor que tengo, la tristeza que no me pasa cuando me pongo a recordar. No, mejor no me pongo a recordar. Y eso nunca se borra de la mente. Aunque intentas dormir, Estás en camino, estás comprando, estás viendo otra cosa por allí, pero uno no se puede dormir. Desde que se despierta uno, ya está esa idea en la cabeza. Porque miraron la cara de uno, o le dijeron una cosa a uno, y esa cosa no se olvida. Lo quemaron. Quemaron mi casa, me quemaron mi chucho. Así pasó de pura tristeza. Mi milpa quemada. Veinte cuerdas de milpa quemado. Frijol. Puro floreado está el frijol. Quemado. Tenía chilacayotes. Floreado estaba ya mi frijol. Ay, Dios. Todas mis cosas. Solo tres gallinas. También perdí las gallinas. Así perdí yo. Ahora ya no tengo nada. Desde ese momento que me violaron, me quedé asustado. Yo no quería que llegaran a visitarme, porque pienso que me van a violar otra vez. Porque yo recuerdo cómo me hicieron los patrulleros que estaban en la finca. Y lo que viví fue doloroso. Sufrí más, mucho, como un animal, porque estaba embarazada. Cuando me hicieron todo eso, yo estaba embarazada. Triste, triste, triste la vida de uno. 
Yo siento que soy sucia. ¿Sabe por qué? No comía. Aunque había comida, ya para qué comer. Y esa balacera siempre es cerca. Del susto me desmayaba. Puro dolor de cabeza. Puros nervios. Eso es lo que me da a mí. Es el susto. No se me quita nunca el susto. Delgada estoy. Amarilla estoy. Ya no es igual. No dan ganas de comer. Yo he visto otras bien delgadas. Hasta que a morir se llegan. Yo vi... Yo vi cómo a mi hija la violaron muchos soldados. 12 años tenía. La agarraron en mi cama. Eran cuatro soldados. Eran cuatro soldados que me violaron a mi hija de 12. Y me decía, mamá, ayúdame, mamá, ayúdame. La golpeaba muy duro. Y ella no paraba de llorar. Por eso me siento triste. Muy triste. Estoy enferma. Y no salgo de la casa. El corazón me duele. Ellos querían que fuera su mujer. Pero yo no me dejaba. Y ellos me cortaron la cabeza. Y me sangró. Y entonces así, pues sí, me dejé. Pero tenía seis meses de embarazo. A los días me salió mi bebé muerto. Tenía diez años. Y me llevaban al destacamento con otras mujeres. Y me amarraron los pies, las manos. Me pusieron un trapo en la boca. Me empezaron a violar. Yo ya ni sabía cuántos pasaron. Perdí la conciencia. Solo la sangre corría. Luego... Ni podía levantarme a orinar. Me acuchillaron. Mire, todas las cicatrices que tengo. Me violaron. Ya no podía caminar. Como una pilota me tiraban, si eran muchos. Éramos muchas mujeres ahí en el estacamento. Había todas. Había todos los nos violaban los soldados. Yo estuve diez días. Y me violaron muchas veces. A las otras mujeres también. Toda la noche abusaron de mí. Todas. Como veinte habrán sido a saber. Al final perdí la conciencia, no me acuerdo. Ay, Dios. A mi niña, le abrieron el pecho, le sacaron el corazón. ¿Qué culpa tenía mi niña? A todas. Ahí nos juntaron a todas. Nos llamaron. Al salón parroquial nos dijeron. Y ahí adentro del salón parroquial, a todas nos violaron. ¿Cómo duele? Duele cuando yo pienso en eso, en el olor a quemado. 
Cuando yo regresé a mi casa, todo quemado mi casa. Me lo quemaron con mi bebé de tres meses adentro. Me la quemaron mi casa con mi bebé de tres meses adentro. Los soldados nos quitaron la vergüenza. Nos dejaron desnudas. Eso fue, fue triste. Tantas cosas que uno vio. Pero mi niña, mi niña tenía siete años. A mí me violaron también. Pero a mi niña de siete años la violaron tantos soldados que me la partieron en dos. Me tapaban la boca y me decían, cállese, cállese que está bonita. La humildad y el respeto es parte de nuestra cultura. Por eso agradecemos, como agradecemos que nos dejen hablar al fin. Llegaron el 5 de noviembre. Cuando llegaron yo estaba solito, porque mi papá y mi mamá salieron. Y estábamos almorzando cuando llegaron. Y me oí con mi hermano que tenía tres meses. Los otros hermanos no se asustaron y se quedaron. Pero yo oí, tenía susto y oí. Dispararon porque vieron que oíamos, pero me fui. Cuando regresamos en la noche, no, no los habían matado. Los habían dejado ahí en la casa. El 20 de noviembre otra vez regresaron. Pero esa vez mataron a mi mamá y a mis cuatro hermanos. Yo me fui huyendo. Me miraron y empezaron a disparar. Pero yo corrí. Corrí, corrí, y no me alcanzaron. ¿Qué, ¿Qué hacían? Mi papá puso muy pan encima, y su papá echó tierra encima. Solito me quedé ahí, en el monte. Mi casa quemada, mi hermanito quemado, ya no los volví a ver. Yo estaba allí, yo lo vi, a mi hermano el tiro le entró por la nuca y le salió por un ojo. Mi familia se murió por hambre. Porque estábamos en grandes montañas, no teníamos comida. Lo que hicieron los soldados nos hicieron correr de la casa. Lo que siento, lo que me da pena, es tristeza. 
No quiero ir nuevamente a la guerra. Yo no quiero ver guerra. Ya no quiero ver más la guerra con mis hijos. Mis hijos, los que quedaron vivos. Y mis nietos. Lo que quiero es que se detenga. No quiero que haya más guerra y que haya más muertos. Y me da mucha tristeza porque de repente ya no podemos dormir. Solo asustados vivimos. Solo pensando en esto vivimos. Y por eso es que venimos a hablar. Porque no queremos que jamás ver esta situación. A mi mamá la golpearon con una piedra en la cabeza y se murió. Nos da enfermedad a nosotros y a nuestras mamás. Y claro, nos, nos desmayamos. Otros se morían. Mis hermanos también se murieron porque, porque hubo mucha guerra. La gente estuvo en un mercado. Y nos dijeron, venimos a visitar a ustedes. Y después que nos dijeron que nos llegaron a visitar, nos reunieron y empezaron a hacer bombardeos. La población se retiró al bosque, escondidos como animales. Y el ejército se comía a los animales. Y tiraban bombas y bombas. Y ahí dormían en nuestras casas. Tres meses. Los que sobrevivimos en las piedras fue. Había ya un agujero. Dispararon a los tres hombres y cayeron al agujero. Enfrente de los ojos de los vecinos, dijeron que ellos eran malas personas. Y que por eso los mataban. Que ellas solo estaban cuidando la bandera. Él tenía mucho miedo, porque el que estaba ahí matado era su primo. Llegaron aviones a tirar bombas en el lugar donde habían los tres muertos. Durante medio día tiraron bomba. Fue en finales de febrero. El ejército regresó nuevamente. Todavía fue una vez la aldea acabada. El ejército le empezó a disparar. Había cinco familias cerca de la aldea. El ejército se encontró y los masacró. Entre hombres y mujeres. Ahí hubo muchos muertos. De todo. Muchos niños. Muchos ancianos. Ya no había vida. Ya no había esperanza. A esas cuatro mujeres, Catalina era una anciana, no sé usted apellido, unos 70, 76 años. ¿Cómo la golpearon y tiraron, la dejaron? A la señora Juana Jolís, a ella le cortaron la cabeza, a Margarita Velázquez. Estaba historiando un animal en el potrero. Alcanzaron. Allí mismo se quedó tirada. ¿Y sabe qué hicieron? La partieron en pedazos. Con un abaco. Un pedazo por aquí. Un pedazo por allá. Muchos pedazos. Puro abaco. ¿Y por qué hacían eso? Como nos trataban como animales. ¿Acaso somos animales, pues? Entre esas 96 personas, había hombres, había mujeres, había niños, había ancianos. A todos los machetearon. Todos quedaron tirados, macheteados. 
ahol bűnt. Ez hozzá tudjuk, hogy ott rövés nyomat a mirván. Mert nem jó újra. Kondor jövő, kondor múlt, és tudjuk, hogy rond, hogy tudjuk, hogy rond. Nem tudjuk, hogy rond, hogy rond. Mert fel faszom, hogy jó. Nem vagyok önk, hogy dolgozom a szótra. Nem vagyok önk, hogy jó. 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 Nem Cuando llegaron pensó que me iban a matar, pero llegaron otras personas. O sus sea, niños llevaron, muchos niños se oyeron ahí, un montón de gente amontonada. Lloré cuando vi que llegó mi tío, y mi tío me dijo, no llores, no llores, que no miren, que, no miren, que me conoces, no llores. Una de mi hermana María Santiago se dio, me cuidaba, me daba comida. Ella me decía que iba a salir a traer a mamá. Pero ella cuando salió, ahí la mataron. Ahí me quedé viendo yo cómo la mataron. Luego llegaron con mi mamá. Yo iba a ir con mi mamá. Estaba llorando mucho. Y cuando vi a mi mamá, desnudo lo tenía. A mi mamá desnuda lo tenían ahí en el piso, llorando. Luego llegó mi hermano con una pelota. Y mi mamá en el piso desnuda como un animal. Y mi hermano con la pelota. Y los tres llorando porque nos encontramos. Y mi mamá me dijo, estoy feliz ahora que te encontré. Mi primera cosa prendieron fuego. Me prendieron fuego y dentro de las casas había personas dentro. Seguritos de los señores, los niños, todos quedaron encarbonados. Subieron más arriba a la casa del alcalde y lo bajaron a la casa del otro feliz. Y lo balearon. A la familia completa lo balearon. Y después prendieron fuego todo eso cosa y todos los demás. Doce o trece cuerpos quedaron allí quemados. Me borraron el cuello de la camisa. Dice que quebró mi cabeza. Me metieron en un cuarto en el convento católico y me dejaron colgado en el higo con la mano por arriba. Me colgaron como a los dos, como a los diez. Me dio siguiente me soltaron. Me soltaron en un tubo. Me quedé sentado por puro sangre. Un sufrimiento entre los sangres, mis queridos hermanos que han muerto. Yo sufrí con mi propio cuerpo. Por eso digo que es mentira lo que dice ese señor, que no pasó nada. Yo digo que sí es verdad. Yo digo que sí es verdad. Yo lo viví. Ese dolor fue verdad. Ese dolor fue verdad. Yo lo viví.